So my name is Rachel, and I work at the Student Money Management Center. We're upstairs on the third floor. If you ever have any financial questions, you can sit down with us. We'll be happy to talk to you. Even after you graduate, we're free to you. So if you aren't in the Denton area, we can still work with you and talk to you on the phone, too. Okay. So come see us if you have any financial questions. So we'll get started. So the first thing to start thinking about as you begin to prepare for uh, buying your first car is really doing a lot of research in preparation to get started. So have an idea of what you want and we'll kind of explore that a little bit later. Identify your wants and needs. So you said, okay, I have a car now. It's not the best. It's a little bit older. I paid for uh, what I got exactly. So you might want something a little bit different or you might need something a little bit different. You really want to take into consideration what your price range is and throughout today's workshop we'll explore that and we'll, I'll give you some resources, some tools, some places to look at different prices for vehicles. And then at the end of all of this, these different considerations, of course, make a list. And this is really talking about making a list of your needs versus your wants and what are your highest priorities and figuring out what those are. And then, of course, last but not least, start to save, and we'll talk about that as well today. So what are your needs versus wants? So you already know you want something different, so what would be the, your ultimate dream car? Oh, I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, like a dream car would be like BMW, but like something that I want, something like more like fuel efficient. Okay. Just something, because I imagine that I would be like commuting to different places. Okay. A lot of like jobs that I would like want to work in are in Dallas and Fort Worth. And the car that I have right now, I just, it would be like a really big strain on it. Just okay. Like, so something a little bit more reliable, maybe something that you're not worried about maintenance wise mm -hmm. and something with better gas mileage maybe, right? How about you? I mean, in terms of wants, I've always wanted a Cadillac. Okay. Because that's kind of like my dream car. All right. But I guess in terms of needs, I do need something that's really comfortable just because I do drive a lot. Um, here in Dallas. Okay. Um, and I also need something that's going to be, like you said, kind of efficient, just because okay. I really don't want to spend too much on gas all the time. All right. So y'all, y'all are kind of looking for some of the th same things that you need in your vehicles because you anticipate that you're going to be commuting, right? Yeah. And so if somebody was said, you know what, I'm going to live here in Denton, and I'm going to work in Denton, it might be easy to get away with a car that maybe isn't quite as fuel efficient, or maybe isn't even quite as reliable because Denton is pretty small, depending upon where you live. So thinking about for yourself, what's the things that you really need um, when you go into your car buying experience, it's gonna help keep you grounded. Um, car salesmen are really good at their jobs for a reason. And so if you have in the back of your mind, okay, what are my priorities? What are the things that would be nice to have that makes it a little bit easier to be able to stick to your budget and not be wowed or wooed by all of these uh, really nice add-ons and additional things that might drive up the cost of your purchase. So this is just an example of a student that worked for us who was looking for a car. They only wanted to spend about $6,000. They wanted it to be under 120,000 miles. They didn't want a truck. They wanted good gas mileage, something not too old. Um, and then they were kind of, if they had to think about what they really wanted, it would be nice if it was black, white, or gray. Obviously, if it had an auxiliary output, because most people now use their phones and plug them into their cars. And then if their dream car would be a Mini Cooper. So this is just an example of they have created a list of their wants up at the top, uh, and then kind of, I mean, their needs up at the top, and then their wants down at the bottom. And you can do that too, and then you can rank your preferences. So before you get into your actual car buying experience, there's three things that I encourage all students to do. And this is true too if you're making another major purchase like a home or some kind of appliance that you would keep for a long time. How much do you want to spend? Have you guys thought about that? What's your number? Uh, like 14000 over like, I don't know, like five or six years. Okay. Like all right. I'd have to see like what kind of like financial like plans they offer. 
Right, okay. You have a number in mind? Um, somewhere between 15 and 20. Okay. And I, was, I did have a question. Is it cheaper if you just buy it, like, the whole thing at once? Yes, because you are saving money on the finance charges. So if you have the cash to buy something outright or pretty close to outright, of course you're going to save money over time because you're not paying anything in interest. So that's why people will do that. Does that answer your question? Kind of. Um, okay. Does it make more sense to just do that, um, like save the money essentially and then buy a car? Or does it make more sense to just get the car and then pay it off over time? Like, because I know one's technically you save money, mm -hmm. but is that, it's like the other one where you lease it out essentially a better, or I don't know if lease the right word, you mm -hmm. make payments on it, is that a better method if you're trying to build credit? Um, it could be a better method if you're trying to build credit, yes, especially if you don't have any credit history. So having a car loan could uh, help you build some credit history if you didn't have very much or it was if, if you only had one type of credit under your, into to your name, because what we look at when we're looking at credit scores is how many types of credit do you have? And that's more indication indicators related to your behavior. And so out of that, we can pre predict different things about what you might do in the future. Whereas if you only have a credit card, we only know how you utilize revolving credit. Whereas if you have a car loan or a student loan or a mortgage, then that's a standard payment that you're making each month. And we can see how your behavior works with those two different types of credit. So it depends on really what you're trying to do financially, credit-wise, too, in the future. Um, does that answer your question? So a more kind of specific way, I yes. guess, would be if they offer you like 0% over like a year, mm -hmm. would it make more sense to pay it off over that year to build credit? And that way you don't occur interest, I guess, in that sense? Or does it make more sense just to pay it out? Right? Like, does one or the other affect your credit more? So obviously paying it outright, it, it wouldn't even be reported to your credit because you're not utilizing any credit. Okay, to, so none of that goes toward your credit. Right, credit. exactly. So if you, if anybody offers a 0% uh, auto loan for a year, let me know too. Because I'm always interested in reading the back end of that, of what if you don't pay it off by your time frame. Um, but then obviously that would be credit based and that would start put, being put and reported into your credit history which would help you if you were doing making your payments on time that would help you increase your score. Okay, does it typically cost more or less to do that? Like to extend it out? Like, like when they have zero percent, does it cost you more since they're not getting all their money at once? It will cost you more if you miss a payment. Okay. And, or you don't pay the full payment and that's where I would say to be interested to see what the small print says. Because okay. usually in those 0% offers, there's some sort of, if you don't do everything to the letter, there's some sort of kind of financial catch to that, typically. Okay. But if you're not worried about that, it's, it's a good deal, okay. obviously, to be at 0% for a year. But if you are kind of on the financial edge, that might not be a risk that you want to pursue. Okay. This is Yeah. Thanks. And just to kind of give you a little bit more information, why somebody might tell you not to buy a cash car, or even if you have the money, is if you can get in, locked into a low interest rate, is there another way that you could potentially put that money to work for yourself? So if interest rates are pretty low right now, which they are, could you potentially, or would you, take that money that you're not putting towards the car right away and invest it and be making money off of your investments? So some people kind of weigh that up. So would that be like a market or a CD account that you're talking about there? Yeah, or even just any kind of regular or old, putting it into a retirement account or money market fund or whatever. Okay. Um, so just another totally off topic <laughs> way to think about your money too that some people consider. So other questions? Those were good questions. And we'll go into more into depth if you guys have questions about that stuff. So. So getting pre-approved, so if you are deciding that you're going to, you said five, six years, you're thinking, okay, let me see what the financing might look like. Getting pre-approved through your bank allows you to understand, okay, how much car can I actually afford? So you said about 15 and 14, 15, you said about 15, 20. Okay, let's look at what's going on credit-wise. What are you actually approved for? And this also allows you to understand what interest rates are available to you. 
And you can use that when you negotiate and when you go into your bargaining, when you're actually going to purchase your car. And I'll talk about how you do that a little bit later. So getting pre-approved helps you figure out, do I need to fix anything in my credit first before I go into purchase to get a better interest rate to save more money over time. And then the other thing to think about is what other additional costs might arise. So we all know that everything doesn't always go to as, as planned. And what other things might you pay for besides just your monthly car loan, if you have one, and your insurance. So what else, what other things might come up in the year um, that you might need to pay for in regards to your car purchase. So some things, numbers to run uh, before you actually get into or to the dealership. So this is just an example of a very simple budget. And this is this particular um, student's budget. So this is how much they might make monthly. They've plugged in some of their expenses. They haven't plugged in an additional car payment yet, so this is somebody that's going to graduate, so they'll be making a little bit more money, but this is where they know all of their money is going now, and it'll probably stay true for them in the future, and then they'll be making a little bit more money uh, once they start working. So they're just trying to figure out, okay, where am I? How can I fold in other expenses? And how much do I actually want to spend? Does this make sense? So if you don't have a budget, I'd encourage you to at least write down a month's worth of expenses so you can see how much a car payment or even insurance, if you aren't paying insurance now, might actually affect you. Or if you get into a new car and your insurance goes up, what would that mean for you financially? Would you have to change something uh, in your financial life in order to accommodate that new expense? Other things that you guys can think about um, that you might spend money on when purchasing a car or owning a car even that isn't up here? You mean in terms of other fees or? Yeah, or other additional places where you would spend money because you have a vehicle. I only bring this up because you guys both talked about commuting, but you might also utilize a toll tag. And so that might also be something that you would consider part of your transportation fees, too. And that's not on here. So something to think about um, if you guys are both going to be living in this area and perhaps using one of the tollways or the new express lanes that they're opening up everywhere. Do y'all recommend getting roadside assistance services like built in or like paying for those services? Like because, some, uh, something like AAA? Yeah, I suppose mm -hmm. something like that. Um, just because as a commuter, like chances are a car's not going to break down either in Dallas or Denton, mm -hmm. for example. It's probably going to break down just logistically somewhere between the way if mm -hmm. it was to break down. Um, so just because our cars just spend the most time mm -hmm. on the highway and stuff like that. And so, you know, for friends or family that's like a drive, you know, it's a, it's a little ways away to just get some help. So would you recommend getting roadside assistance or like how does road, because I don't really know too much about roadside mm -hmm. assistance unless I like call for, you know, uh, uh, to get my car towed or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, I've never really looked into it that much. So roadside assistance can sometimes be folded into your car insurance and it's a little bit cheaper that way. So you might ask whoever you have your car insured through, do you offer roadside assistance? And they'll, di they'll tell you, sometimes there's different packages, sometimes there's a set package. So they'll sort of tell you what's included in that. If you do something like AAA, um, it's not very expensive. It's cheaper if you're on a family plan, I'll tell you that. So if you know some other people who want to be a part of your family, it's just like a phone line. It's cheaper if there's more people part of the plan. And that basically gives you access to 24-hour roadside assistance if you have a flat, if you break down, if you lock your keys in the car, if you need to be towed. The one thing I will tell you, the limitations with towing for any of those packages uh, that you get into, whether it's AAA or something through your insurance, they have a limit on how many miles they can go, where it's included in the price of your roadside assistance. And then after you hit a certain distance, you have to pay for the rest of that tow fee for whatever that mileage is. So you could end up paying a little bit if that was something that you were concerned about, being towed in particular, if you have maintenance issues all the time, where it might not, you might not break even. Most people are going to break even, and a lot of those roadside assistance packages also come with other benefits since you're a member. 
So for example, some of those would be hotel discounts, discounted tickets to different theme parks, things like that. So there's also kind of other membership perks too that aren't just related to your car. The other nice thing here um, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area is that if you're on in the NTTA, they provide, as part of your toll fees, they provide roadside assistance. So they'll come and help you fix a flat. If you run out of gas, they'll come and help you do all those things too. And that's free because you're paying the tolls. It's not really free, but it's, it's a part of the, uh, the amenities of using the toll road, right? So does that kind of answer your question? So it's just really a preference-based thing. Um, I have it because I used to live um, in a really rural community and I would drive really long distances by myself. So for me, it was like more like a security thing. Um, but it's just going to sort of depend on your personal preference. So. Other questions about roadside assistance? So something you also might factor in in the fees um, as well if you're interested in utilizing that. So let's jump into different ways to, you kind of helped me lead up to this about different ways um, that you can pay for your car. So a new versus used car, the payment uh, options can vary. So a lot of times you can pay cash for a new or a used car. Um, they look at you a little bit differently when you pay cash for a new car just because um, it's weird in this day and age for somebody to come up with uh, $20,000 or $15,000 um, in cash. They always kind of have questions about that. Um, thinking about what your down payment might be if you have a trade-in. So you have a car now, and do you know how much it's worth? Uh, no, I don't. Okay. And do you have a car now? Uh, no, my dad let me borrow his car while I go to grad school. So. Okay. So you're, you would give that back to him? Yeah, whatever okay. I can sign. And I'll jump onto the loan cal calculator here in a minute and tell you a little bit about financing. So I talked about the pre-approval. You can also get financing through the dealership itself, and that's where you hear about the first year 0% interest, those types of deals that they have going on, usually at the end or the beginning of a model year for cars. Um, and so you can get financing either from your own bank, an outside bank, or even the dealership or the car a dealer themselves. And then you can also consider leasing a car. And this is basically just paying, um, it's, you're basically renting the car for a long period, between three and five years. This is probably the least favorable thing that you can do financially because there's a lot of restrictions. Uh, you have to bring the car back at the end of the lease term in certain condition. You have to have stayed under a certain amount of mileage. And if you haven't, then you might have to pay additional fees once you turn the car back in. So for most people, it's going to make sense to purchase a car outright and not actually lease a car. And then like you talked about, obviously, um, you can pay in cash. And that's an option um, for anybody. And in particular, if you want to buy a car online, either through Craigslist or even Carfax, you can buy cars from them. Um, so lots of different places where you can buy cars. So um, for your financing, and this is kind of an example to give you um, what it might look like. So you said 15000 right, was your top range. Yeah. And do you plan on having a down payment or no? No. Okay. I mean, if I, yeah, no. So let's, let's say we, you trade in your car, though, and they give you $2,000. So let's say you're going to finance $13,000. How's that? Okay. So let's drop that down. And you said uh, you were going to do it in about five to six years. That was sort of the auto loan rate you were looking at. So if we do five years, and this is bankrate.com, and this is their auto loan calculator. And so that's basically more or less what your monthly payments would look like if your interest rate was 3%. So if you got a good finding, if you got good financing either through the dealership or through your a bank or a financial institution of your choice, that's more or less what your monthly payment would look like if that was the loan term that you decided to get into and that was the price of the car. So you can play around with this tool and kind of plug these numbers into your budget. What you can also do here, um, this, is also, this is what bank rate looks like when you go to their homepage. You can also look at oops, 
You can also just sort of get an idea of what are the different interest rates in this area right now. And that should sort of give you a barometer for, okay, how much should I anticipate potentially paying monthly if I am going to go into financing. And of course, it's going to depend on the length of your loan term. And it's also going to depend on what your credit history looks like as well. So that will make a big impact on your monthly payment. You can also do some price comparison here on Kelly Blue Book. Um, so, anybody looked at cars already? Um, I did a little bit like a month ago. What did you look for? Um, I looked at a uh, Toyota Corolla of okay. 2013. Uh, and let's see. You're doing new? Oh no, you're doing used probably, right? Yeah, I did like used and then like certified. Pre-owned. Um, let's plug in. Is there a big difference between used and certified pre-owned? So the certified pre-owned means that it's been reviewed by somebody who has been trained by the manufacturer to look at that car, examine it, inspect it, make sure all the parts are working, uh, make sure everything if any, is anything aftermarket, so maybe something got replaced with just a generic radiator or whatever. And so a certified pre-owned is just a little bit more a uh, stronger type of inspection and it sometimes can come with a guarantee or a warranty attached to it to say, okay, this is certified pre-owned, your warranty lasts for six months or up to how many other miles, if something happens, you can come in and get it fixed for a discount or, uh, or we'll cover the cost. So that's typically what you see um, with the certified pre-owned. So, do you want to do Denton? Uh, I did it in Temple, which is like three hours away, but we can do Denton. Though. Okay, so we'll do this. No, I don't know. And it asks you lots of questions, so if you're not a car person, <laughs> this can be a little bit overwhelming. Um, so we'll just say certified pre-owned. So we can look, and then these um, are the price ranges that are of the vehicles that are near us. And this is a nice way to just do some um, comparison shopping. And of course, there's other websites, and this is Kelly Blue Book, and I pull it up because you can also look at what is your trade-in value for the car that you have too. So I just want to show you a few things um, that are a little bit different, you know, between a new and a used car, some things that you might take into consideration when trying to determine which one you want to go with. If you get a new car, obviously there's probably going to be less maintenance uh, because it's never been driven before. There will also typically be warranties and protections that are still in place with the new car, which like I talked about earlier with the certified pre-owned. You can take the car in to get all your oil changes or your tire change or whatever's in your warranty for so many miles or a year or two years, however they have the warranty set up. And that's usually done through the dealership. A lot of times, and I'll caution you as you go into buying a car, if they're trying to really sell you on the warranty, um, that's going to add additional cost to the car itself sometimes. So be careful about um, getting into a lot of warranties. Um, and the nice thing about new cars now is that if you want to drive for Uber or Lyft and make some side income, you typically have to have a little bit of a nicer, newer model car um, versus something very old. Um, so I have a 2002 and I, would, you know, I just looked to see uh, and they were like, no. <laughs> so that's a nice uh, perk if you're interested in doing that. Some negative things about new cars, the price is going to depreciate. Um, oh, very much, which means when you go to resale it, um, you're not going to, unless you just get a really specialty car or something where they only made a few of them, probably not going to make a whole lot of money back on your car um, when you decide to sell it. And then of course, obviously a new car will typically cost more, except for what type of car do you think is just as much used as it is new? Think about the state that we're in. A truck? 
A truck, <laughs> yes. Trucks, amazingly, are just almost as much used as they are new. So those really hold their value because they're very valuable in this state. Maybe you move to the East Coast and you have a truck. Might not be worth as much, but uh, that's one thing to look for is the type of car that you're interested in use. Sometimes certain uh, cars will really retain their value versus other brands or types. So obviously used, there's a better price point. It can be a little bit cheaper to insure uh, a used car. There could be uh, more maintenance attached to it. The nice thing with a used car now is that almost anybody who is a used car dealer will provide you with a Carfax report which will tell you everything about the history of that car. The only thing you don't know is how the person or previous owners actually drove that car. So were they really rough on the car and maybe that hasn't shown yet um, in wear and tear or maintenance, but it could in the future. So that's one thing to watch out for uh, with used cars. But always, um, if you're trying to get more bang for your buck, you're probably going to be a little bit better off in a used car. Um, but the one thing I will say about new and used when you go to buy is that uh, dealers actually have less flexibility in negotiation with new cars than they do with used cars. And that's where dealerships make the most money actually is on used cars and then on the service that they provide through their garages. They don't actually make uh, the majority of their money off of new cars, which I think is really interesting. So there are a few things that you want to do when you start thinking about getting into your car loan. So we talked a little bit about credit earlier, but um, I would encourage you to go in and look at your credit report. You can get it for free at annualcreditreport.com. And you can also look up your credit score on creditkarma.com. You can create an account here and this is free. It only shows two of the credit bureaus and there are three major credit bureaus that financial institutions use to look at your credit. So if you want to get your score from all three, you can go to myfico.com and you do have to pay a little bit of money for your FICO score. It's not free. It's about 20 bucks. So some different options. So make sure you understand um, what's going on for you credit-wise um, and that gives you a little bit more leverage when you're going into your negotiation. So this is just an example of the different price points. Um, if you have good credit, okay credit, bad or no credit, and you can see that if this person purchased a $12,000 car after their down payment, so maybe the car is really originally 15, if they have good credit, they have a 6% interest rate on a four-year loan, two-year loan, they're paying about 281 on the four-year loan, on the two-year loan they're paying 515, and then you can see as their credit a score goes down, they pay a little bit uh, more um, depending upon what their credit score is. So this is just to kind of encourage you to really understand what your credit looks like right now, what you can perhaps do um, to improve it, and if you have questions about that, we'll always be happy to answer um, or provide suggestions to you. And then this will probably dictate uh, what your end monthly price looks like too. Mm -hmm. What's considered good credit? Like, what would get you that 6% interest rate in terms of, like, a number? So, if you looked at your FICO score, which is the most common scoring system that most people use, um, that's a 200 to an 850 scoring system, and <clears throat> the kind of break-even or whether you're a good person to lend to or not is around 620. So, if you're above 620, you probably will be approved you probably will be more in this sort of, these two areas. If you can get up into that 700 range, that's a little bit more favorable as far as getting really low interest rates. So, that kind of help you out? Yeah. And give you an idea. Um, and I'll show you too on my FICO in a little bit, there is a range where you can plug in and you can see the difference. There's a little calculator where you can look at the difference and what the scores mean. Um, so that 620 is really the magical number and then anything above that really helps you even more. So going back to the payment, um, once you have checked your credit and you are pre-approved for your financing and you know kind of what car you're interested in, where you're going to get it from, 
the next step is to actually go into the negotiation process. So if you've never bought a car before, um, this can be really intimidating for many people. If you have absolutely no interest in negotiating, there are companies that you can contract out to actually do the negotiation for you. And then the dealer, uh, some of that money comes from the dealership to pay that person. It's just like an apartment finder but then negotiate your car uh, payment for you. So that's one tool you can use. If you are going in to negotiate yourself, there are two things that I encourage you not to bring up, which they will ask you about, which is one, how much do you want to pay in your monthly payment? So you don't want to talk about that. You want to know what the overall price of the car is because once they've got you locked down into a payment, it's a lot harder for you to negotiate the price of that car down. And then two, if you have a trade-in. So you don't want to factor your negotiation or your overall final price off of your trade-in. Um, so keep, don't bring up those two things uh, when you go into the negotiation process. And I'll show you um, what to look for um, in order to help you negotiate a little bit better here in a second. Um, so there's two things that you might want to do some research on when you go into your negotiation. And this is the invoice price, which is established by the dealer, and the MSRP, which is established by the manufacturer. So the MSRP tells the dealership, okay, here's what the car is probably worth, um, here's its value, and then the dealer will put on the car, when you go to a car lot, they will put that uh, price on their little labels if you've ever been to a car lot and seen. And this is the price which the dealer has kind of set to actually make some money off of um, the car that they have bought from the manufacturer. So that's where um, you can do some wiggle room if you know the difference between the MSRP and the invoice price that's on the car itself. So I would encourage you to look those two things up. Really easy to find um, on the internet. The only thing that's not going to help you in negotiation is what's the fair market price of that particular car. So if a sports car is really hot right now, or let's say a Tesla is kind of the thing to get into if you have quite a bit of money to, to spend on a car, those are really hot in the market. The market price is actually pushing those the value of that car up. So even if you wanted to do some negotiation off of the invoice price, the dealer might say, forget about it, because somebody else is going to walk in and pay this price because that's what's happening right now in the market. So a few things you can look up and do some investigation about um, to utilize in your negotiation process as well. Mm -hmm. So are you trying to push the invoice price down to MSRP? Because is that ideally what you want to pay as close to MSRP as possible? Yes, that's your kind of ultimate goal. Um, and I was reading about this earlier today, and I want to say they had a percentage or like a rule of thumb of how much you can push it down. I might be wrong, but I want to say it's like 12% down. So if the invoice price is this, you're more likely to, you probably wouldn't be able to knock it down more than 10%. So just be aware of that. Um, but I might be wrong about that because I was reading lots of, that, <laughs> lots of stuff about car buying today. But, um, just because this is an invoice price, that doesn't necessarily mean that the dealer is going to lose money. Because when we purchase something on scale, they might get a good deal from the manufacturer anyways. Okay, purchase 10 Honda Odysseys, which is a minivan, and we'll give you an additional $2,000 off the MSRP. So they might still make money even though um, they're paying, they have it at this established invoice price in which they say, we can only make money if it's if we get this much for it. It may not be true. So it's another kind of negotiation tactic that they use to make more money. So would it just be cheaper just to like buy the car online, for example, where it is MSRP? Like is that a thing? Or like if you just buy it directly off like Toyota.com or something like that? Is that is that a, can people do that? People can certainly do that, but it is pretty much expected in particular for car buying and a little bit for home buying to, to do this negotiation process. And it's just kind of how the market's set up. A lot of times, even if you buy something online, you might still be able to negotiate it down if they want to move that particular model year. Maybe they've been sitting on that inventory for a long time. 
they might still be willing to work with you. So if you can keep more money to do other things in your financial life, it's always beneficial. Um, and if you're not interested in negotiating, like I said, there's different people who do that. And there are people who work specifically with online dealers who do negotiations for online dealers and negotiating the prices that they have listed. So it's really up to you. Um, most people will find that the more things that they add on or the amenities, that can also be something that they can negotiate. So while you could still go online and go to toyota.com and buy that car at MSRP, there might be missing a few things that you want, and that might be something that you negotiate. Hey, I'm willing to pay the manufacturer price if I can get the car with the automatic locks or whatever. And some, those are some other things that you can kind of negotiate in that process too. Because from what I understand, the manufacturer price is the cheaper price than like a dealership? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. But it, that's where you get into have they... I don't know. I haven't looked online besides on Kelly Blue. I haven't looked at a dealership online in a long time. So I don't know if you've looked. I have. Do they usually show you the invoice price and the MSRP? They don't. Uh, I haven't seen the MSRP. Yeah, on they didn't think so. Two of the websites that I've looked on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. I'll have to investigate because I never thought about that before. Just always thought a deal. You know, usually it's just through it, even an online dealership. Um, some other things that you can negotiate too is actually your interest rate. So if you're unhappy with your financing, you can try to negotiate your interest rate lower. That's a part you can uh, negotiate. You can also negotiate, like I talked about, with the automatic locks, different things about the wind, uh, car itself. For example, if the car is used and you notice that the tires look pretty worn and that would be something you'd have to replace pretty soon, you can negotiate, okay, I'll uh, take this price if you'll give me a new set of tires or replace the rims or whatever you want to have happen. So there's some other things um, that you can negotiate in your car buying process as well. So a few other things to watch out for um, when you're in the car buying process is buying something as is. Um, that means it probably has some interesting issues to deal with or a lot of as is cars come from um, areas where they have a lot of flooding and perhaps that car has experienced some flooding. And a lot of times that doesn't impact the car initially, but long term it can cause the car to have a lot of electrical problems or um, even issues with the gas tank and how the engine fires over time. So be careful about those. They can be really good deals and really enticing, um, but they can also lead to more maintenance costs in the future as well. Um, the last thing I would tell you about when you go to car buy or look at cars even, maybe you're going to buy online, but when you go to look at cars, um, make sure that they have everything um, that you feel like you're going to want to spend money on. So a few things that students that have come to us in the past have not paid attention to that later on after they bought the car, uh, they didn't realize the car didn't have. So one of them is automatic locks, if that's important to you. Um, another thing is cruise control. Uh, so always take the car for a test drive too, if you have the opportunity, um, and make sure it has all of the elements that you want. So once you have purchased your car, there's a few things, the money doesn't stop yet. So a few things uh, to think about. The first thing is going to be insurance. If you don't have insurance now, you'll want to get on an insurance policy and you have lots of different options when it comes to insurance. And you can kind of do a create your own policy or they'll provide you different ones to choose from, whoever you go with, Geico, State Farm, whoever you prefer um, for insurance purposes. Um, liability is probably the cheapest form of insurance that you can get. This protects you and any other people, um, not in the car, so if somebody's in the other vehicle and you have an accident, it will pr provide coverage for them. Um, but it does not actually protect the car. So when would somebody want to get liability? What do you think? Like a motorcycle, I would assume, because Okay, so that's a good example. What else? I was thinking like used cars. Yeah, used cars. Your car, you pay 2000 for it. It's yeah, probably close. Yeah, so 
Um, if the car gets totaled, it might not even be worth it to pay the deductible to have insurance replace it, right? So that's why a lot of people will pick um, liability. There's some other options that you can plug in. Uh, you can plug in medical payments, which covers you, uh, your passengers, and then anybody else in other vehicles, and they have a formula and how much uh, they cover. It depends on the policy that you pick. Uninsured and underinsured motorists, and then you can also get on a family insurance policy, which covers you and anybody that you give permission to drive the car to. So that might be useful um, if you share uh, your car with somebody else in your life, too. So the average cost for um, most people, depending upon uh, the type of insurance that they get, is going to be about $1,000 to $1,500 a year. It can be cheaper if you're on liability. It can also be cheaper depending upon your age. Um, so once you turn 26, that's a magical number for whatever reason in the insurance world. Uh, your insurance usually goes down. And it can also depend on your car, and your car insurance rate can also be dependent upon your credit as well. So they look at your credit um, when they decide um, how risky are you. The next thing to think about is oil change, your tire rotation, inspection, and your yearly registration. How much is that? And then just overall general maintenance, that's going to be something that you want to factor into the cost of your car as well. And if you decide to get or take advantage of that roadside assistance plan, that might be something you add as well. And what do you guys think the average yearly cost for car maintenance is? Very close. $766.50. So that's the average cost for just sort of general overall maintenance um, and then license and registration for a uh, car. So some other things to factor in to your budget. So what kind of questions do you guys still have about the car buying process? Uh, for someone like me who doesn't, like, I, I don't have credit at all, like I don't have a credit card or anything yet, mm -hmm. and like I'm pretty like, I'm pretty sure I'd have to get like co-signed by like my mom. Mm -hmm. and. She's someone, she doesn't have like good credit, she's probably like okay credit, mm -hmm. and I just don't, I don't know. So, I, don't know. I don't know what my best options would be. So if you really needed a car, you could get into a car loan with a cosigner or even with a high interest rate. And what you could do after a year or at least about 16 to 18 months of payment is you could go in and refinance the car note. Now, it's going to cost you a little bit more money than if you just kept a straight, uh, if you got in at a cheaper interest rate or a lower interest rate, excuse me. Um, but it might be worth it when you run the numbers at that higher interest rate to try to spend a little bit of money to refinance, and then you get that lower interest rate over those years, and that can actually save you money. So you want to do a little math in that instance, but that's what the majority of people do who maybe don't have any credit and they really need to get into a vehicle purchase. They'll take something at a little bit of a higher interest, or they'll have a cosigner. Then, after they've been paying on the car and been having positive credit history, they'll be able to refinance and look at a much lower interest rate. So, just an option, but just know that it costs a little bit of money to actually refinance. So, other questions that you guys have about the car buying process? Concerns? Um, when buying a new car, or maybe like a certified pre dom Does mm -hmm. the so like for my car, I had the option like I could do like fully insured or liability. Mm -hmm. But for like a new car or like a certified pre dom don't you have to get full like full coverage on it? Typically, like if it, if it's a new car, you do. yes, and it will also depend on how much you put down for a down payment. So if you don't put down very much for a down payment, what they will um, require you to get is something called gap insurance. And so you carry that gap insurance until you hit the equivalent of that down payment or um, to the point at which they say, okay, if something happened to this car and it got totaled for whatever reason, the company that financed it wouldn't take a total financial loss. And that's what the gap insurance does for you. And they can talk to you about that at the dealership, or you could seek your own outside gap insurance if you want to. But usually that's a requirement for a situation like that. Good question. Did you have a question? 
Okay. <laughs> well, um, we're the Student Money Management Center, so we're upstairs on the third floor. So as you get closer to your car buying date, uh, we'd be happy to sit down with you, help you make a budget, look at some different car options, look at some different financing options. If you have questions about credit, we'll be happy to talk to you about that too. And if that doesn't happen before your graduation date, um, you can always talk to us on the phone and we'll be happy to help you out too. So come see us and let us know uh, what we can do for you.